everybody welcome to woodworking wisdom my name's colin way and with me is my name's ben if you remember yesterday we done a similar sort of thing where we were both working to create this this um nativity scene so that was the opening shot you saw there so craig can we oh sorry we got craig as well on the cameras mustn't forget craig usual format everybody apart from ben is going to be asking the questions so use that chat function get your questions in and then Ben can ask me directly, okay? Craig's controlling all of the cameras. So, yes, if we could go back to that nativity scene a minute. So what we done yesterday, what rather what Ben done yesterday, was that silhouetted backdrop. So using the scroll saw to create the backdrop for the, the wood turn characters. Now, if you've seen yesterday's um, stream, you would have seen a lot of chat about making it into different um, a different scene with different figures, that sort of stuff. It's entirely up to you. We're making it Christmas because of the time of year, but you can make these throughout the year and make whatever scene you want to. We're going to concentrate, though, on the nativity, and uh, I've got one, two, three, four figures to make for you, and um, within those four figures, there's a few parts. As usual, there's lots of um, lots of uh, different tools that we're going to use, lots of techniques in terms of holding, that sort of stuff. So get your questions in. Um, and then away with you. I know I've already seen some pictures of people that have already made these as well. So well done for those people that have sent any pictures. Um, and the best thing for these characters, I think we need to make the, the timber or the wood that you're using are the stars of the show. You don't have to. Of course, you can paint or airbrush. But on these figures, they look really nice using those special bits of timber. So I've got a few different bits of timber here. We're going to start with, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to start with one of the wise men. And we're going to use a bit of you for that. We we'll use a beach head. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do for the for the headdress yet. And but then we've got some satin wood um, for uh, for Joseph and Mary. We've got some ash and some more you. We've got a little bit of tulip wood, all those sorts of things. So there's a few things to get through. Um, so like I say, fire those questions as you have them. So look, this is where we start. I'm going to give you measurements on the the sizes or the figures that we're making. Um, but you know, you can see specific to this project. It very, very uh, is is down to you. You can make massive figures if you want to. You can make them extra small. We have used these figures to dress the carousels, Christmas carousels in the past. Um, so you can see how we can upscale, downscale. Um, but the one particular sizes that we're using, we're starting off with an 80 mil um, long blank, and it's 35 mil um, uh, across. Okay, so 35 by 80. That will give you roughly what we want. That's on the wise men at the moment. So just keep reminding me. If I forget to give you sizes, just keep asking, um, and we'll get them for you. Really, really quick projects. These completely open to beginners and things like that as well. So, all right, Ben. Hi, Cohen. I've got a first question coming. Go for it, yeah. As this from Woodwork Learner, and they're asking both you and Craig, um, how come you were slaughtered in the quiz last Friday? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, well, um, un unfortunately, Craig's not mic'd up, so he can't give the answer, and, and unfortunately, it was his fault. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, really. Didn't have enough Star Wars questions, I think, for us. Star Wars or Dirty Dancing, which is um, Craig's specialty. So, yeah. Next time, though, we're up for revenge. Next time, it's going to be our, our night. I like it when it's Craig's not here to defend himself. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do, nice and quick. So we're using a, a light pull drive here, six mil hole in the bottom. That's quite important. I've got the six mil hole in the bottom for several reasons. So on all of these figures, look, just that little six mil, that's going to be used later on using a paint stick. Um, I'm going to need to clean off the very top of what we're going to create. It's a dome in effect. Um, so we need to have that just just to hold and if we want to use a paint stick to put color on or lacquer on which we'll be doing later on then that's that's again it's needed but that um the light pull drive is perfect for that so lay speed to zero turn the lathe on you hear me saying that all the time it's just just part of my sort of safety routine really when we start um even though i'm going to be going up fairly quick this is up over 2000 revs we'll start off with a with a roughing gouge. <clears throat> the only reason I'm starting off with a roughing gouge and not the skew, unlike um, if I was using a softer timber like pine or tulip, it's just really hard. It's really hard. Um, and so it will probably stop if I if I use the skew. It will cause a few issues for me. So just quickly run down with a roughing gouge. Have the, um, the, the gouge actually facing away from me so I don't get covered in shavings.
Yeah, I was just dropping down to a cinnamon. Now, ben, can you just pass me one of the wise men on the yeah. on our scene there? So, thank you. So, what we've got, the actual wise man is lying that way at the moment. So, what we're creating is this, this little shape here. Then we can sand our flat, and then we can create the face, the, um, the headdress, the hands, which are important. To hold the um, the either the gold, the frankincense, or the mirror, whichever that the size it's going to be. There we are. Okay. So that's where we we just rough down to that point. Now you can use your skew chisel, you can use your bowl gouge, spindle gouge, any of those things. We also need to clean up the bottom edge here. However, that can be sanded later on as well on your sanding disc if you want to. Um, I'm going to sand. I'm going to clean it up now because I want to use the paint sticks to hold this to finish it off. So let's uh, let's get a skew. Could I just interrupt you a moment, Colin? Of course, yes, yes. So we've got a really important question here um, from Maria. Does Craig do dirty dancing? Every weekend, Maria. <laughs> and um, Michael Davenport, he says he's been trying to make the nativity set, um, but how do you make the crib and baby Jesus? You wait about 40 minutes, Michael, then we'll have a look at how we do that, Okay. And it's, it's far easier than you think. It's probably the easiest part of the whole um, project. So look, what we're doing, we're just going to start roughly shaping. I need to allow some space for the mark that the, um, the tail stop center would have left. So let's rough down some of that. At the moment, it's looking a little bit too long, so I'm just going to come right the way over. We're going to sand these. I want to get a finish on this for you, or a sanding sealer at least. There we are. And we want a nice dome. Right the way over. And we will flatten this off late. We're well, not flatten it off, but we will clean the top of this dome off in a minute. We are. Now I'm going to clean up this bottom edge. Don't forget we can use the sander as well in a minute, the sanding disc. Down to our centre. And once you've done that, once you've cleared the, the, the bottom surface, then you'll need to just tighten up with the tailstock again because you've actually taken um, length away and so you've, you, you've backed off the actual biting point. So just pop the tail sock, advance the tail sock on a little bit and you'll be good. We're going to stop that, just have a look now and see where we are. I think we're good to sand. I just want to make sure I've got no horrible, um, nasty tears. No, we're right, okay there. Really nice sim with this, you. And you can come in lots of different shades as well. This is a particularly pale one, but that's fine. It's still that nice orangey colour. But you've got a lot of swirly grain going on. So we get the dust extractor going. Now you've got to be fairly careful with you. Some people... Some people can be allergic to it. So if, you, if you're if you not sure, if you're getting a reaction after coming out of the workshop and you've been playing with you, more than likely it, it will be that. But there's lots of timbers. Um, things like cedar are, are quite potent as well. So just be a little bit careful with certain things. Um, if you're feeling a reaction, it might be worth just stopping um, using that particular timber. I'm very fortunate. I haven't found one yet that I'm allergic to. But down with the speed a little bit. I'm going to bring the, the, the extraction a bit closer. I'm going to start with a 150. I'm not pushing too hard because there's only a small amount of material there. hoping that you can see how simple um, this sort of a project is if you're just starting out in your wood turning what a great project to start with you know a Christmassy project great presents as well you know lovely little gifts so that was a um, that was a 150 let's go to a 240 I'm gonna treat myself to a new bit of 240 and 400 I'm using the, the RB406 abrasive. 
The reason I tend to go with that one is because it's a material bat and the resin that's bonding um, the abrasive to it is really strong and I can use this over and over and over again. I can wash it out with oil and water. It's absolutely fine. Or if your paper's starting to get plog uh, clogged up, put it in your jeans pocket or your trousers pocket and then put it in the wash. It's amazing. It cleans it out really, really well. There we are, 240, 400. I would put a sanding sealer on these. These are going to be sanded, um, have some uh, flats sanded in. But if you use a sanding sealer where you can initially and then reintroduce some sanding sealer once you've sanded the first flat, that'll give the acrylic sealer, sorry, the acrylic lacquer or whatever finish you decide to put on it, um, it'll give it a nice canvas ready to, to give you a really, really good finish bit of 600 grit a lot of these denser timbers do prefer um, having a, a really fine abrasive as well because you may not see it I can see very fine scratches um, on that surface um, so a 600 because it's a dense material will help I'll just turn off the extractor and I think then Ben might have a question or two there we are that'll do us yes Ben so David's asking, are there any uh, drawings that he could um, refer to to, to save him from taking notes? For for the um, for these, um, not on not on this stream at the moment. Um, what I'll do, David, is for next week's stream. Now, just to let you in on what we're doing next week, we're doing German smokers or Russian, um, and we'll have some. Uh, line drawing for those, and I'll put the line drawings for the nativity. I have the the figure line drawings. Ben posted yesterday the actual template for the scroll saw work. Okay, so let's get them both in next week for you. All right. Uh, a little bit of tissue, just to take off any excess. Now the sanding sealer that we're using here is a 50/50 mix of cellulose sanding sealer and cellulose thinners. Now, if you read the I almost had to get you to do that then, Ben. Um, if you read the um, the instructions on the tin, this is chestnut. If you read the instructions and you talk to Terry, Terry will tell you not to thin it. Now, he's right. Absolutely. He knows his product. Um, but the reason that I'm doing it here is I want, because it's quite a dense material, especially on some of the exotics, if you introduce a, um, a thinner, it will go in a lot further on those dense materials, plus being cellulose thinners that we're using, it will eat through any of the really oily um, substance that's in it. So if you're using things like olive or lignum, cocobolos, those sorts of things, they can be quite oily. And it's it, when you use a water-based sealer, they, it struggles to actually penetrate through. But adding a, a thinner to cellulose sealer helps it penetrate a bit further. So that's the I'm not sort of knocking anything that, that Terry does. He obviously knows his, his own products, um, but that's my reason for doing it um, to them. There we are. So a little bit of sealer on there. Take off the excess, but you don't really need to do anything after this. Once you've um, done this, you don't need to sand it back because we can use um, a polishing mop to get our final finish. And the polishing mop in turn is an abrasive compound, so it'll do the final sanding for us. There we are. That's good enough. What I'm going to do now is just take a little bit more of this nib away so we can get to it to sand in a moment. And rather than just doing one from start to finish, we're going to do all the bodies and then we're going to move on to the heads and the hats and all those sorts of things just to help you on. Yes, Ben, another question. Frederick's got a question here um, about the sanding sealer. Um, is it a good idea to use sanding sealer under, um, under spirit stains? Um, he would have thought it would stop the stain from sinking in. Well, you're dead right. I mean, that, if you think about what a sealer is, it, it's designed to stop the penetration from anything or the grain rising up. So you, places where you wouldn't use a sanding sealer would be on oil, so finishing oils, that sort of stuff, and on stains where you want it to, to actually go in. Now, I've tried to use um, sealers before stains. What happens is the stains sit on the surface. The minute you contact them with something, it comes off, and also they don't dry. So, no, you're dead right. Sanding sealer for things like um, polish, 
So if you're using acrylic polish, um, French polish, uh, polishing compounds, uh, wax, all of those sorts of things, that's your sanding sealer. But um, spirit stains, um, uh, uh, palette dyes, uh, and uh, oils don't use a sealer. All right. We, we treat the timber in a slightly different way when, um, when you do that. Now, you can put a clear lacquer over the top of a stain. That's fine. No problem at all. Probably two or three coats, lightly denibbing in between, and then you've sealed and locked everything in. Okay. And when you apply an oil, you sand the oil in to do the same job. It raises the grain. You, you sand that grain away. So it's a different, different way of finishing. Okay. So just taking off as much of that material as possible. What I don't want to do is shear material off because what will happen then I'll have a big hole in the top of this piece of timber. There we are. So now there we go. Good. So we've down, gone down to so much that so fine a point that that stopped moving. We can take that away. Unscrew that one. And there's the start. We have to clean this little nib away. Okay, that'll be done in a moment. So we've got another one to do. Let's do... So in this case, we're going to do the same thing. This is going to be the actual um, shawl of our Mary. Just wind it on to the, to the drive. Then I can adjust my tool rest. So now I'm going to speed through this one. Double check to make sure we're down to round. Pretty much. There's a split running through this one, but we can ignore that. That's fine. As long as it doesn't, uh, as long as it stays stable, then we're okay. So what I'll do is the bottom section first, where it's at its widest. Let's make that right first. There we are. Get rid of any nasties. That's gone. Then we'll just allow some couple of mil three mil there look just for the the hole that the center will make then to shape Now, if you're a bit nervous about doing that with the skew chisel, don't worry. Use a spindle gouge, use a bowl gouge, use whatever you're, you're happiest with. Just cleaning that bottom up. And then we're ready to sand again. So dust extractor, and we'll repeat. Do you want me to do any questions before I put the dust? No, we're good. No, you're okay. We'll whip through this one so we start with a 150 and work our way through Whee! thank you ben cheers buddy so 150 usually that ends up down the extractor so we were lucky that time there we are so 150 240 400. There we are. I'm going to double check that before we go to the 600. What I would say when you're sanding is don't be afraid to go back. Very often I won't turn the lathe off or sand from like maybe 100 all the way through to 400. Um, without turning the lathe off, 
So you get to 400, you think it looks good while spinning, and then you turn it off, and there's actually scratches there. Don't be afraid to go back to your first grades, um, because otherwise you'll only see those marks forever. There we are. Nice and quick start to Mary. We're going to do a lot more in a minute. Hi, Colin. Yeah. I've got a question here. Well, a suggestion from Maria in Wales. And she said, if you just put a little in out curve at the top there, hey, Presto, you got a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you, Maria. <laughs> And then um, I've got a question uh, for me from, from Martin. Um, he's asking um, if he wanted to carve an ear of wheat about two inches long, um, say into a breadboard, uh, what chisel would you recommend? Um, and you want something nice and fine for that. I would go with um, like a B tool or, um, or something like that. the flexi cut ones are really good, really sharp out the packet, um, good to, you know, good to go. Um, or one of the very, very fine kind of veiner type tools. Um, and the two will give you, the, the veiner will give you a very kind of smooth, um, rounded cut. And that V tool will give you a, a little bit more precision and a little bit more um, um, kind of clean, clean lines of a V tool. Um, so yeah, give one of those a go. Oh, and Roy's asking, what size blanks are you using? Is that the same as the, the first one? So, yeah, so this is the same, Roy. So this is, um, it was 80 mil by 35 um, for, for Mary. And we are going to substantially um, take material off of her, though, because we're going to, she's going to be a two-part piece, um, piece of turning. So we're going to do a little bit of split turning in a moment as well. Um, but yeah, she started off at the same at the same size. You can make her a lot smaller as well. And certainly, when it comes to doing the Joseph in a minute, this is a much smaller blank. I'll give you those measurements. I know it's forty five. I think it's forty five by fifty mil um, Joseph. So we, we'll talk about that one. But yeah, that one's the same. There we are. I've done the same there. We're just going to go down to that small area. Um, we're, we're really enjoying um, getting suggestions and you, what your suggestions do for us is give us give us a library of projects to be able to do throughout the year. So as much as we're having fun with Maria's suggestion of penguins, we are going to do penguins. What I would like, though, if you could, and I know loads of you have been sending in pictures already, send in some pictures. Maria, send in your penguins. I know you've done a load of them because then we're going to use that and we can show that if it's okay with with you when you send them in we're going to show that on this live stream so we can we can look at the inspiration behind the project that we're going to make that would be a really really good feature so if you could do that guys if there's anything you want us to make we're doing another collabor collaboration after christmas and we're going to do the um the basket weave bowl um where i'm going to turn and ben's going to decorate uh, that one so those are the sort of suggestions that we we like to get in so yes right there's mary so let's do Joseph. Now, this is all the same stuff for the moment. So, just excuse me while I just crack on and get this done. Well, this is the last one of this sort of shape that we're going to do. Just get it mounted on there first. This is a lovely bit of timber. This is a bit of satin wood. This is out of Jason's stash, and I took this while he wasn't looking. I don't think he'll notice. Really, really dense timber. If I'm honest, I would use, I'd probably go with Timbers Native to you, first of all, for cost. Um, but secondly, just, I just think it's it's a nice statement, you know, it's a nice thing to give. Um, here in the UK, we've got some lovely burr oaks. In fact, um, mainly, yeah, it was all native timbers to me in the UK here that we've got our, our nativity scene. We've got a nice burr oak, we've got a brown oak, we've got yew, we've got some nice maple, um, we've got some elm, some um, ash, a, a real mixture of timbers. The only thing that isn't native to, to us here are the, the headwear, the headdresses, which is the uh, uh, a bit of paduk we've got there.
just been a little bit aggressive with the tools just to get this done nice and quickly for you really this is a slightly shorter dumpier dome for our joseph That's about the right shape. We'll stop and have a check before I clean it up. Yeah, now it's called satin wood. You'll see in a minute when we um, when we uh, sand it and put a finish on it, it actually is, what do they call it, like chatoy. It's that real shimmer that you get from timber. Really jumps out of this material. It's a lovely timber to use, um, a lovely timber to look at. Oh, and I've got a few questions. Go for it. Um, a couple on, on sharpening. Um, the first one from Robert. Can you remind him how to sharpen your skew? Depends. R Robert, just let us know what sharpening device you have a minute whilst we go on to the next question. Pop that in the chat a second, and I'll be able to make it bespoke to you. To you. And then Adrian's asking, how best to sharpen his accidents the mini turning tool set? That's bit, uh, again, what sharpening device? Let, okay, so if you're if you're using something like a Tormek, um, I would go. I would be tempted to go freehand especially on a Tormek, with that size. They're very, very tiny little chisels, and it's easy to, to get the, um, the grind right by hand because of their size, because they are so small. If you're going to use something like a, um, uh, a benchtop grinder, I'd be tempted to go for CBM because that keeps that steel really, really cool, and you're only talking with tiny, delicate little um, amounts of steel there, and it's very easy to get those heated up if you... Um, use carborundum or aluminium oxide. So if you can go something like CBN or, or water, you'll benefit there. Um, but on things like the skews, you could, which you see me sharpen all the time, you could use just a diamond uh, file. Um, and I'm often just picking one of these out of my back pockets. Okay, just a little, um, one of this is one of the accidents, the diamond file. It's got um, a coarse on one side and you've got the fine on the other. Fine is around about 600 grit and coarse being about 300. But yeah, that would be enough um, a lot of the time. Um, and honing. Uh, so honing with a leather strop, again, you can do that off a machine. You can just get a piece of leather and use some um, some honing soap to, to do that yourself. And honing does make a big difference, not only for removing burrs, but it gives you a longer lasting edge, especially on the lathe. And turning and wood turning tools um, have to put up with a lot of pressure. So if you can get them honed to really sharp edge, they'll last you a lot, lot longer. Right. And then I've got another question here from, from Sol. Um, he says, hi, guys. Having trouble with cloudy patches on a CA-finished Wenge pen. Um, looks like glossy translucent patches admits an otherwise glossy transparent finish. New glue, okay temperature. Um, has we got any suggestions? Personally, I don't have any experience with a CA finish. Yourself, Ben? Um, I've seen it in action. I'm guessing it should be something to do with moisture. Uh, maybe where we're touching it, it uh, you know, those CA finishes or glues um, kind of react or go off um, when in contact with moisture. So it could be something uh, to do with that. Maybe a you know a, a kind of a sweaty fingerprint, fingerprint yeah. Um, something like that could do it. Because once that layer goes on top, and then you use your activator, if there's already a bit of moisture on the layer underneath, it's going to start going off on that area uh, a bit quicker. A lot of the time, you know, moisture, um, we talk about that with acrylic lacquers, um, you know, this sort of thing. If there's moisture in the air, and in the UK at the moment it's particularly damp, um, it, it can create blooming. Um, so a dry atmosphere always works better. It, you might find it's something like that, but uh, apart from that, um, I'm not sure, if I'm honest. All right. Keep going with questions, Ben, if you've got any. Okay. Just throw it at the bottom again. we are and I'm just going to take a little bit more away from this top edge here and then we're gonna we're gonna move on so a bit of bit of dust extraction Keeping that move, that paper moving. 
this particular timber and the U that we were using a moment ago, this will craze, it will split. You get it hot on the end grain especially. So make sure you move your abrasive around. And, and don't fold it over. If you're folding your abrasive over to protect your fingers from heat, the timber's getting too hot. So make sure your fingers are detecting that excess heat. So just a reminder to Robert, um, if you could let us know what sharpening system you have, um, whether it's a grinder, um, a linisher type or format, um, then Colin will be able to answer your question on the skew. There we are. That'll do us. So a little bit of sanding sealer. So, yeah, one other thing to add when it comes to sharpening um, any tool, really, don't get caught up too much in, <laughs> I'm going to say, I was going to say what, what people say, um, just sharpen the chisel. There are a, just a few, I would say, rules, more angles more than anything else. But those angles are very um, varied. You can, you know, certainly if you were talking skew, we can change the skew angle from anything between sort of 15 degrees right up to sort of 35, 40 degrees if you want to. So don't get too worried about it. Just have a go. You know, you, you're only going to get good at sharpening if you, you do it, you practice it. In terms of skew angle on my tools they're supposed to come with a 25 degree bevel angle single side so 50 degree overall um, angle they don't always because they're hand fettled hand fettled at the end they're finished by hand on a linisher um, that doesn't matter because it's as simple as if you have a, a finer angle then you drop your handle down further if it's a lesser angle then you bring that handle up so you know you, you don't worry too much about that bevel angle but get it as long as you can get it roughly a single bevel as opposed to a multi-bevel. Um, when I say single bevel, I mean your primary. You can always put a secondary bevel on to the contact area if you want to. But uh, no, don't worry too much. I've, most of the time I'm freehanding these. They will go in a torment jig because the torment jig nips onto the front edge of its, um, its clamp point. So don't think because it's a parallel jig that it won't be able to hold one of these. It does. It nips onto that front edge quite well. Um, and then use on a tool mech especially, or you can you can adopt the same um, technique on a bench grinder. Um, look at the side of the wheel. You're trying to get a 90 degrees, you know, from where you're sharpening to the side of the wheel here, you see. So look at that. And we use a little trick when it comes to tool mech sharpening just by putting a uh, uh, using the bar and describing a little line with a felt tip across the wheel to line up where we have the cutting edge of the skew. You could do that on your bench grinder. It's not as easy to do, but if you that's if you're using jigs, of course. Um, but yeah, little and often. Once I've mechanically sharpened this, and I've actually done this one today because it was starting to get a little bit out of shape, I won't touch that on a, a bench grinder or sharpening system of any type for probably about another 25 to 30 sharpens. Most of my sharpens now will either be a hone or a diamond file on those. Don't need to go back every single time. Do you ever use a... A, a curved skew, Colin, from Fuller? Um, not out of choice, but I would if it was put in front of me, yes. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't see the benefits from it. The thing is with my flat skews, I can use them to V-cut. I can use them to, um, to plane cut as well. So you get so many benefits from that, and I find them a little bit easier to use. And also... Um, you've probably seen me using them as parting tools as well, cleaning up ends. I just It's a multi-tool for me, and if I start introducing a curve, it'll make it a little bit harder. I also like to use them to create the dovetails for, for feet on um, for my chucks and that sort of stuff. So those are the reasons that I would always stay, stay straight. Okay. I'll tell you what is out there and what are good. Um, maybe look at Richard Finley, look at Dave Dolby, look at Steve the Woodturner. They use uh, round and square um, skews or almost parting tools, but they are really effective as well. Um, so, you know, you've got you to use what's right for you and what you feel happy with. Um, I developed those really from that German design because they, for me, they mean that you're not holding the tool ultra um, tight. So you get that feeling back in your hand. You can feel the bevel rubbing. Okay, so yeah, have a look. Uh, other people as well. Les Thorne's another one. Um, using that sort of square type or round type of skew. Okay. 
Right then, so that's done. I'm just going to take a little bit more away from there and then we're going to do a little bit of sanding on these. They grip really well on these sensors, so I'm just using the, the rotation to ease off the friction. There we are. Quite nice. The only thing we've got left to do now, I want to do the front face. Did you pass me Mary there, uh, Ben? The front face of Mary. So look at this. This is two pieces here, this one. So the bit that we've already turned is the back. They're a shawl. And so we just want to turn that front face rather than sanding all of my turning away. Look, what I've done is just done a little glue block. So we're just going to turn that into a similar shape. No need to drill this one because we're taking most of this one away. Um, so a little glue block. We do have to change centers for this. And I have done some um, split turning for you before. And the reason that we need to change centers, um, obviously the, the light pull drive, there's no hole for the light pull try to drive to go into. If we use single pointed centers, you'll end up, that'll create a wedge and it'll open the piece up we don't want to do that prematurely so what we'll do is go with ring centers that bind everything together so you've seen ring centers before there's the drive center and in the tail sock i've got exactly the same um but with on a revolving center okay um pinpoint your center point which is the cards doing one place for you you just need to get halfway up that card line uh, pva glue we've used on this it's nice fairly quick drying this is a this will be dry this is the B, um type on type on two i use here so i have it to hand what was that center you were using before colin the one that's just come out a light pull drive there we are light pull drive Okay, um, specifically designed to, to use with things that already have a hole in light, light bulbs, like our nativity scene, that sort of thing. All right. There we are. So let's do our shawl, or sorry, the front of the of Mary's dress here. We're rough down with a rough and gouge. Relatively small, I want this. There we are. Let's go to a skew and we'll just create the shape. I don't want to be too hasty with this um, and go down too small too soon because otherwise I'll go down to the paper line, the card line, um, and then it can split in two again too early. So it's just for the moment, we'll give that a little bit of a sand. I'm not going to bother to clean up the underside of this one. I've got a ring centre there, which is in my way. And once these two pieces are glued together, I'm going to re-sand the bottom anyway. That's a 150, 240, and then the 400 again. I'm going to show you another another version of Mary in a minute as well, just to give you some ideas. Now 
There we are. Now I can go down in and clean up this area here before we part that off completely. Okay, now just in case that comes off before I want it to, I'm just going to turn the extractor off as it's conveniently placed directly below where we're working. Okay, so there we are. You can see clearly see that card running through the center. So what I want to do now is just split that in two. So I need to get rid of a few of my, my tools out the way. So what we'll the questions, uh, Colin? Okay, mm. just fire them off. Yeah, go for it. Um, so uh, Robert, he says he's a new member, looking forward to learning plenty. Um, he says he's watched your Nutcracker vid online. Um, is there any chance of a set of drawings for them? There are yes. If you've watched the YouTube vid of us doing that, then the drawings are there. Now below in the all the uh, uh, all the other links, you'll see the very first line. I think it is um, is a link to the drawings. So have a look there. And then um, Norman would like to know what what is in the sanding sealer. Sanding sealer. It's a cellulose sanding sealer. So I've got a 50 50 mix cellulose sanding sealer and 50 percent cellulose thinners. That's all I know. I don't know what makes it up. It's cellulose. <laughs> Right, all we're going to do, so I want to split through the um, the card, so I've got a little carving knife here. Just be careful. Um, oh, I don't need to say that, but I do. Um, just be a little bit careful through the card. Watch your fingers. There we are. So we've got two for the price of one. Look. So now we can start sanding. If I give you that one, or oh, no, we keep holding that one. This is what we're making with Mary. We've got hands and things to do as well. I'll, I'll show you a little bit about uh, how we do those. The face is easy. You can see that. But we're going to do um, a few bits like that in a moment. So sanding disc. I don't think any of you out there are going to be surprised about the sanding disc. It's just our regular sanding disc we use on our C jaws on a... On the faceplate ring. Dust extraction is coming on as well, again, for obvious reasons. But there we are, my seed jewels. We've got our faceplate ring on the sander. That's going to slot onto that on the dovetail. And dust extraction right below, really important. And I don't want to be going too quick. Again, if we go too quick, dust is going to fly everywhere. It won't be able to be taken away by, by the dust extractor. And it doesn't really matter how powerful the, your extractor is. Too fast, too much air velocity, it's going to shoot away. So keep that reasonably slow. About a 1,000 revs is, is ideal. As we've been talking about her, we'll do Mary first. We'll do the main body, so in my excitement, um, I've skipped a step. Come back to the sander in a minute. What we need to do first, of course, is clean up those little areas that we couldn't get to before. I've completely bypassed that section. So these little areas here, all right, they need to be cleaned up. So we're going to use a little bit of paint stick. I'm going to go to another set of jaws, but basically any set of jaws you have that goes down to zero, if not zero, three, four, five mil, because I want to hold a piece of six millimeter dowel. So those are my set that I'm going to demonstrate with. They're a set of pin jaws. At home, I would probably go to these because this is what I was brought up with and used to. If you're a new turner and you don't have these, don't buy them for this job. These can be great for holding other things. Go for something just a little bit safer to protect your fingers and go for your pin jaws if you've never used those step jaws before. 
Uh, within that, we're going to use a piece of six millimeter dowel, and that's going to be our hold method. Don't worry, we're not going to take a massive amount of, of turning um, to this. All I want to do is make sure that's secured on there and flat against the jaw. You're not going to take big cuts. Don't worry, things aren't going to go all over the place. If you're gentle with a spindle gouge, don't worry about a little bit of wobble either. Gentle with a spindle gouge, not a skew, not a bowl gouge. A bowl gouge on end grain like this will tear and it will grab the piece. Skew chisel, the timber will run up the length of the skew or the, the cutting edge of the skew. A spindle gouge is a combination of the two tools. So we're going to use that to cut a nice fine cut. Cut the tool rest a little bit. I'm going to do all three. There we are. And then you've got good access now to go in with your abrasive. I'll only go 240, 400 because we're only dealing with a very small area here. Remember what I said about heat? 400. Okay. Bit of sealer on there would be good. Um, let's do the other two. As you just mentioned the sealer, Colin, um, Frederick's asking, what's the difference or advantages between the spirit cellulose and acrylic sanding sealers? Yeah, so acrylic is a, is a water-based sealer. They're, they're, they're okay if you're going to use... Um, uh, well, you can use pretty much anything over the top, like we were saying earlier, so waxes and um, uh, lacquers, those sorts of things. That's fine. Um, but it doesn't have the penetration that you can get with um, cellulose through oily timbers. What the benefits of a, a water-based is, you know, water and oil don't mix, so you can put a, um, uh, a lacquer over the top. You're not going to get any bleed through. It's not caustic in any way. Um, it does take a little bit longer to dry than cellulose. If we go in drying times, it'll be cellulose for speed. Then it'll be spirit because, it, again, it's the spirit. It evaporates quickly. And then we go water. So that's the, the time scale. Spirit stain is like a French polish. It's a dilute version of French polish. Um, so, you know, again, that's, that's, that's good. Um, not my choice, really. Again, it won't penetrate as well as cellulose. Um, and it can be quite sticky as well things can stick to it so my choice would definitely always be the cellulose um but we need to see where cellulose goes in the future we may not be able to get it we who knows um what happens with that um and we were talking about sharpening your skew earlier mm. um so robert has the um credit card type of abrasive, uh, like a credit card abrasive your file yeah yeah no problem yeah well the same sort of thing so um what i'll do literally is just i'll concentrate on a secondary bevel so i don't know whether if i can get this to glint for you there we are you can see a secondary bevel on the on the edge that's what i'm sharpening go with the fine edge fine and just give it a few licks either way every now and again don't wait for it to go blunt keep it sharp keep it sharp don't wait for it to dull off now, a little um, hone on a piece of leather with some um, honing uh, soap would also benefit. And I use the, the I benefit here from the, the honing wheels on our Tormix. I'll do a lot of honing on these with that. But you can just use a piece of leather. Absolutely fine. No, no problem at all. Um, and then they'll last you for ages. I've got um, a carbon steel skew chisel I brought from my apprenticeship. And I finished my apprenticeship a long time ago, 84, no. Uh, 80, 89, 89, 90, something like that anyway. So a long time ago, it's just still with me, and it's still about six inches long, so that's that's pretty good. There we are. So that's that one. One more to do. I'm conscious that we're spending an awful lot of time here. What's the time, Ben? Have we got plenty we of time? Are, um, 
10, 2, 4. I've done the rest yet. <laughs> right, there we are. Quick sand. Roy, the boy's asking, could you just sand the tips rather than putting the tool on there? Um, you can. You can. You've got to be careful blending in the shape, and you'll have a slightly different... If you, if you talk about sanding disc, you, you, I can never find it gets fine enough, even... Even if we're using a 400 grit from a, um, you know, a power sander, what you find is you do tend to get little facets that will always be seen. So I find this helps. This is, is much better. Bit of sanding sitter on there, and we're done. Right, that's enough for turning just for the moment. Do I have one more, Colin? Keep going. Yeah. So absolutely. um, Sidley would like to know um, when would you use this? the shellac sanding sealer when would i use a shellac i wouldn't use this shellac sanding sealer um my favorite is just i go cellulose all the time um maybe if i wanted to put what would i need i haven't found much well i haven't found anything reacts to um cellulose sanding sealer as long as you let it dry it's got to be dry um and we're talking for it to properly set you're talking about five minutes it'll be dry to touch in I don't know, a minute or so. If it's feeling cold, you know that that's still drying. So it would be about five minutes and then you can put all your finishes on the top. Um, but no, I, I don't, I just don't use it. I'm sure, I'm sure if you, if we, if we read the um, manufacturer's instructions, I'm sure it would say where we should use it and where we shouldn't. Um, but from my experience, I tend to go with cellulose all the time. Right, now we can go back to our sanding disc. Let's create our flats. This is a, let me just double check that I'm telling you the right thing. 80 grit abrasive on this one, look. Okay, and it's on our Velcro backing. Dust extraction is a definite must. And we're gonna create the flat first for our wise man. So the wise man, again, can I just grab one of those, um, Ben? Lovely bit of burr rope. The wise man, now you can do two things to the wise man. You can either have a single flat at the top here, like this one, or, oh sorry, you've got the double flat like this one. So they've, they're a mixture, you can do whatever you want to. They both look really effective. Um, let's do a double on this one. wherever you think it should go. And once you've done this, you do need to then tidy it up. 80 grit's not fine enough. And what I tend to do is go then straight to my power sanding pads and use those in the chuck just to clean up what we've done. There we are, I hope you can see that. So there we are, our two flats, if I give you that little side profile, and that'll give you, that'll give you that effect. Okay, so nice and straightforward. So now clean this up with your, up to your 400 grit on your power signing discs. We will eventually, I won't do that for you today, but eventually you will need to put a two millimeter hole in here, and that will be your access point for your hand a little flat then sanded on the hand so you can put your little um your little container uh, on top of it epoxy resin is what we're using but what i'd like to do for you now is just turn one of these hands uh, one of these heads as well in a hat okay so we'll, we'll put some slightly smaller timber on let's do our joseph slightly different profile for joseph we've got a single flat A little bit larger because this has to hold his crook and his head. And this is giving the impression that he's sat down and his robe is covering over the top of him. 
There we are. Nice big flat on him. All right. And then, lastly, we need our Mary. This is a big one. So we need to. What we need to do here is take the majority of this away. A little bit of split turning would work for this. So we've got that dust going nicely down the extractor there. You might need to reposition where you're sanding just to make sure it does go down there nicely. Questions? Yeah. Um, so Graham's saying he's got a, uh, a small bench lathe. Um, what bowl gouges or what length bowl gouges would you recommend to, to use as a small bench lathe? Okay, I'll demonstrate that in a minute, Graham. It is a it is a thing, you know, when you're using a bench lathe compared to a floor standing machine like this, they are different sizes. You know, you've got a difference of centre height to bed in a lot of cases. So you'll need to go with something that has a short steel and a short handle. And a lot of the time, this is going to sound silly, but a lot of the time you'll find that bowl gouges that are in sets will be short, so they can get them in the box, and that is a thing. Um, so I would always recommend sets. There we are. This is a nice big flat there for our Mary. So that's the back of her road. We do her front. This is one of the halves that we've already done. So you can see how that's going to save me a massive amount of time. Get rid of the card. I would say that's about there. Maybe we want to go a little bit thinner. Let me just turn the extractor off just for the moment. Maybe we might like to go a little bit smaller here in terms of its thickness. But it's looking pretty good, if I'm honest. I'm quite happy, quite happy with that. Let me just get the finished one held up. Okay, so you can see where we're going. Once we've turned the head, that's uh, that's giving that, that really nice effect, that two-tone effect that we get and the look of the robe. Okay. So that's pretty good. Uh, again, a two mil hole drilled in in this section for the hand. And the hands on, on Mary there, she's praying. She's not holding anything. So, and again, it's turned as a round. You can see the profile. Um, and then a flat, just sanded on both sides to give that, that uh, effect of a, of a set of hands sort of praying together. Okay. So nice and... Nice and simple. We always say simple, but it really is. Let me turn a few. Let me turn a few heads. Um, we're going to use a bit of beach. Let me. What shall we have? Let's go with. Let's have Joseph over there, Ben. Okay. So the the head is a very very simple bit of turning. Um, in fact, in in this case, both of the the headwear and the the head are the same, just different sizes different timbers but look it's just a little sort of bottom of an acorn really um we'll do that now i'll use the same jaw as we did before the pin jaw and i'll do a few of the smaller pieces and then we're pretty much there so that pin jaw and you can use any timber really um whatever skin tone you want to create there's a timber out there for it. So I've got a, se a selection here. Okay. A skin tone, um, including beach. There we are. So including beach. So we've got any skin tone that you want. We can go as light or as dark as you, as you want to make. Let's go. I'll do a, 
head first. Beauty of these jaws is look, they're deep. So you can get your, your blank in there. They're good and strong. And what you're going to do with this is just a very simple shape. Don't overthink this one. We'll use the skew and we'll go with a little 12 mil skew. Parting tool next. It's important that we get a good um, top to the, the head. Little bit of abrasive, 240, 400 maybe. But if you get a good finish off the tool, you, you can start much lower. Much lower than 150 that we were starting with earlier. Then that one can come off. These are really, really quick pieces to make, by the way. Okay, so that's one, that's one face, head. Bear with me, and we'll do a, another headwear. Let's go with a different color. Yes, Graham. So uh, Graham, who was talking about having the shorter um, bowl gouges. Oh, yeah. Um, and that they come from the set. He says he's already got quite a lot of um, tools. Yep. Is it possible to buy them singularly with a, with a um, short handle? Yes. Yes. Um, if you drop me an email, drop Woodworking Wisdom an email, um, I'll put you on to the right um, parts, okay? Um, because off the top of my head, I don't really know what the numbers are. But, yeah, absolutely. Because um, you, you need that. Like I say, you can see up here what we have. So these are my main bowl gouges. They're individual bowl gouges. Now, look at the length of those. If we're on a bench lay, that's not going to be any good. However... Short, short, same manufacturer, this too, by the way. Um, but that was much shorter because it's come out of a set. Okay, so yeah, we can get we can um, we do those individually. Do me an email and I'll get it to you. We keep this headwear a little bit bigger. Want a nice little flat. And then again, bit of abrasive. Let's, we're going with a 150 here. And we'll part that off. But whatever timber, you've got scrap timber um, lying around. This sort of size is great. For sort of the unused edges from pen blanks, that sort of thing. What I'm going to do now for you, if we try and sand nibs, that you've left on that away, you'll end up sanding your fingernails and that will get lost down the extractor, okay? So don't do this under power, but if you have the sander or your sanding disc and literally just use it as a, as a flat surface, and that'll clean that off for you, give you a nice flat finish. And if I grab the, the head that I've made, that I've just made, what did I do with it? There. I'll do the same thing. There we are, and we have have a little head. By the time I've got that glued, I'm going to sand a little flat just there, and that will then locate onto. I'm trying to do this up the right way for you, but I haven't got enough fingers. That will locate onto 
the flat of our wise man. That's how simple these are. But they don't look anything until you actually start gluing them together. There Now, whilst that camera is in view, let me just show you a few other things um, in terms of shape for you. So let's say we've done our Mary, but you want a slightly different shape. So there she is. Okay, nice, simple one, that one. Once you want it, if you want to push it a little bit further, maybe something a little bit different. She's got a hair um, down the back of her shawl in that case. There's no guessing here where the um, turning shapes are. You can see that fairly simple shape again. Two for the price of one because we've got one half as the back, one half as the front. So you can make two at a time there. The head is a simple one. Okay, a simple shape sanded flat on the neck to allow it to go onto the back cape. And the hair, again, it's just a little pear shape and then split down the middle. Okay, or sanded down the middle. If you're going to do that, and it, I'll say the same thing with this little fella here. So Mary had a little lamb. There we are. So what we've got is our little lamb. These are three turnings, all of the same shape. The body is one shape. Head is the uh, is the same shape. And the ears are the same shape, but the ears are split through. A little sanded flat on this area here um, for you to glue together. But uh, again, really, really effective little shapes. Nothing tricky to, to think about, really. And a flat on the bottom for him to, to see it or stand. Okay, let me just get these all of these back together. Now, one thing must do this before we finish today is talk to you about the cradle um, and the baby. We're going to look at just doing a little cradle. If I can give you those back, Ben. Thank you. So if you could pass me the little manger there with our little jelly bean, our little jelly bean baby. Okay, so I haven't glued these yet. Look. So you can see the shape that I'm using here sand half of that away so it looks as though he's asleep in the cradle and our manger i've just used dowel for the manger um this is a piece of beach dowel this is slightly smaller but this is going to be another another manger so our dowel is there again a big flat sanded on the top and a small flat sanded on the bottom and a slight curve profile just sanded on that edge there Okay, taking the flat away. But that's all that is, a very, very simple. And I don't want to say that um, the baby is an afterthought. It's not, but it's such a small component that it is, even though it's the focus of our characters, it's not the focus of um, of the nativity, really. And it's the, the bigger figures tend to be the focus. There we are. Thank you, Ben. Let's just have one last look at the nativity finished together so you can put it into context what we've just been doing. So you can see our wise men there, you, the two shapes, one with a single sanded flat and one with a double sanded flat. Then we have our Mary and Joseph figures. Um, I will post the line drawings out for you on next week's stream. Um, uh, if you're watching that uh, or watching this recorded, it'll be on our uh, German Smokers Part 1, okay, along with the Smoker line drawings as well. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed that. If we got any more questions, Ben, before we shoot off? No, that's it. Lots of thanks, and, and thank you for a great demo. Lovely. Thanks. Well, give us give us your opinion on what uh, on how you think this slightly new format's going. We're quite enjoying it, the fact that we've got two people on camera. Um, but, again, with any ideas, just keep them coming in. But thanks very much for stopping by again. Don't forget, if you like what you see, give us a thumbs up, share it. Um, subscribe to the channel if you're new guys to uh, guys and girls to to watching today. Um, and thanks for stopping by. See you again next week. Bye bye.